Hi, and welcome to this video about piecewise functions. In this video, we will explore what piecewise functions are, how piecewise functions are defined, and how piecewise functions can be used. First, let's look at the definition of a function. A function is a relationship where a single output is assigned to each input. Many functions belong to function families because their equations and graphs all have similar characteristics. For example, functions in the linear family have equations that resemble f of x equals mx plus b, and their graphs are straight lines. Functions in the quadratic family have equations that look like f of x equals ax squared, and their graphs are parabolas. Piecewise functions are not considered a function family on their own. As the name suggests, they are functions comprised of pieces of other functions. The first piece we're going to look at is the absolute value function. Functions in the absolute value family have equations that resemble f of x equals the absolute value of x, and their graphs all have a characteristic v-shape. This is the graph and a section of the table of values of f of x equals the absolute value of x. Instead of a single v, f of x can also be visualized as pieces of two linear functions. On the left, f of x equals negative x, and on the right, f of x equals x. As we read the graph from left to right, we are on the function f of x equals negative x until x equals zero. At that point, the function definition changes to f of x equals x. The domain of the absolute value function is all real numbers. Normally, both f of x equals negative x and f of x equals x also have domains of all real numbers. But if we were to graph them together, the graph would look like this, and we would no longer have a function. So each piece needs to be defined on a section of its domain in order to define a piecewise function. If the left function is only defined for negative x values, and the right is only defined for positive x values, and we put a zero into one of them, more on that in a minute, we can define this as a single piecewise function. One way to visualize this is to graph both linear functions and then erase the sections that are not part of the absolute value function. Let's take a quick break and practice describing a couple of piecewise functions in terms of what their pieces look like and where those pieces are defined. First up is the greatest integer function, f of x equals the floor of x. This is called the floor function or stair step function. This function is made up of pieces of constant functions that are one unit wide. Next, we have the sawtooth function, f of x equals x minus the floor of x. This function is also called the castle rim function. And this function is made up of pieces of parallel linear functions that are one unit long. The format for defining piecewise functions has this general form. There are two criteria for naming piecewise functions. One, reading the pieces from top to bottom in the list corresponds to reading the graph from left to right. So the first piece in the list is the left piece on the graph. And two, the domains of the pieces must add up to the domain of the entire function. Let's start by rewriting our absolute value function in this form. Here's the list of expressions that define each piece from left to right. f of x is equal to the subset of negative x, which is an unknown quantity, and x, which is also an unknown quantity. Now let's take a minute to consider the domain of each piece f of x equals the absolute value of x has a domain of all real numbers. We can input any number we want and get out a single output. But we have to be careful with our piecewise definition when we consider x equals zero. Why? Because zero is a defined point on both pieces, but we only need to include it once. If we write the function like this, f of x is equal to the subset of negative x when x is less than zero, and x when x is greater than zero. Then neither piece includes zero and the domain is incomplete. If we write it like this, f of x is equal to negative x when x is less than or equal to zero, and x when x is greater than or equal to zero. Then we are not defining a function because we're saying that f of x equals both negative x and x at x equals zero, even though the output would technically be the same in this case. Since zero is in the domain of both pieces, we simply choose which piece to put it in. Both of these equations correctly define the function. All of our examples so far have depicted piecewise functions with domains of all real numbers. The pieces do not need to connect and they do not need to extend to plus or minus infinity. Take a look at this function and try to define it with an equation. And yes, that single point is a part of it. 
f of x is equal to x when x is greater than negative 7 and less than negative 3, 1 when x is equal to negative 1, square root of x when x is greater than or equal to 0 and less than 4, and x when x is greater than 6 and less than or equal to 7. Like other functions, piecewise functions can be used to tell stories. This is the story of a car journey Bob took last week. D of t is equal to 50t when t is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 3. 150 when t is greater than 3 and less than 3.5. 25t plus 62.5 when t is greater than or equal to 3.5 and less than 7.5. 250 when t is greater than or equal to 7.5 and less than 8. And negative 62.5t when t is greater than or equal to 8 and less than or equal to 12. Let's see how many of these review questions we can answer about Bob's journey before we go. How long did the journey last? It lasted 12 hours because we go from 0 to the end time is 12. How far did Bob drive from his home? Well, if we look, we start at 0 and the furthest distance we go is 250 miles. How long did it take him to get there? Well, if we go up to 250, we see that we're at 7.5 hours. What was Bob doing from 3 to 3.5 three hours? Well, if we look up here, we see a flat line, so that means he wasn't moving. When did Bob turn towards home? So if we see the graph is increasing all the way up until we hit this mark, which is at eight hours, then it comes back. So at eight hours, he turned towards home. When was Bob driving the fastest? If we look over here, we see that the slope is the steepest from eight to 12. Referring back to our list of equations from earlier, we can see that for the time period of eight to 12 hours, the coefficient before the t is 62.5 which means that he was traveling at 62.5 miles per hour. What was Bob's average speed from zero to eight hours? We also need to refer back to our equations from earlier to see that he was driving 50 miles per hour for zero to three hours. Then he stopped for half an hour, which would put him at zero miles per hour for that half hour. Then the next four hours, he was driving at 25 miles per hour and then took another 30 minute break. So if you add up the speed he was going for each hour, you get 50 plus 50 plus 50 plus 0 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 25 plus 0, which equals 250. Then to get your average speed, you divide that 250 by 8 hours, and this gives you the average speed of 31.25 miles per hour. That's the end of our review questions. Thanks for watching, and happy studying.